the rates at which our mortality and fertility rates are going, going down. Uh, they're approaching actually middle income levels. Uh, population growth has dramatically slowed. The record is uneven across the uh, various provinces in Nepal, but on average it is slowing very fast. But we remain a very low income country in LDC. The projection is that we'll become a, an easing society by around 2028 and we'll have the next 26 years to make this uh, dramatic leap. By 2054, we'll become an easy society. So, next 10 years, we'll remain a young country. After that, we'll have this uh, window of around 26 years. Now, if you look around uh, the world, especially in Asia, and look at which other countries mimic this demographic trajectory, that's a, it gives you a very sobering position. So, Indonesia comes very close to the kind of demographic transition that Nepal will, will face. So India, Indonesia will start to become an easing society from 2027, and it too will have this 25, 26 year window when uh, it jumps into becoming an easing society by around 2053, 2050. What's the difference between Indonesia and uh, Nepal other than the size, population size? Well, Indonesia, on per capita terms, is already five times richer than us. Right? So this is what I mean by Nepal will likely grow older before we can age. Another country, Malaysia, it's, uh, it will become an aging society in around 2020, and it will have another 24 years before it uh, shuts that window and becomes an aging society. But Malaysia right now is already 10, years, uh, 10 times richer than Nepal. Japan actually followed a similar trajectory as us, but much uh, decades before. So Japan became an aging society in 1970. It became an aged society in about 1994. So in a span of about 24 years, um, it made that leap. And of course, Japan uh, is 50 times richer than Nepal. Right? So this story uh, is extremely important uh, to recognize this feature. The second feature, the second idiosyncratic uh, aspect of Nepal's development path, trajectory over the next uh, few decades, is we will, um, we will have heavily urbanized well before having meaningfully industrialized. This is also a very, very fundamental phenomenon in the sense that uh, you don't need to go back to the Industrial Revolution to argue that it was industrialization that propelled you know, all the surplus labor from the farms to move into the cities and that led to the birth of uh, major metropolis all around the world, especially in the Western world. But in Nepal's case, you know, when I was a kid, we read uh, all these uh, textbooks that said Nepal was a country full of villages. If you wanted Nepal to develop, you had to start from the villages. You know, nine out of ten Nepalis live in the villages. So, you know, it's a very rural, sort of centered narrative of Nepal's development. But you look at the data now, 63% uh, of Nepalis already live in urban municipalities. 63%. Now, granted that many of the so-called municipalities don't have even the basic urban amenities that you expect from a you know, functioning town or a city. But classification-wise, categorically, you know, we, we call them municipalities. And the ambition, therefore, is embedded in their development plans and forthcoming budgets to aspire to those urban uh, benchmarks. But the point I want to extract from this uh, feature is that the traditional paths of trade and industrialization um, are already evolving. So the 20th century pattern of trade and production has undergone a massive shift, especially after 1990. Uh, and this will change radically in this century as well. So we need to identify new sources of economic growth. And this is where I want to think. You know, what forms of industrialization? What will be today's manufacturing? Mm -hmm. The kind of manufacturing, the characteristics associated with traditional forms of manufacturing, especially in the 20th century, you know, after the post-war industrialization that we saw in East Asia and beyond, that's not going to be replicable. Even East Asia won't be able to replicate an East Asian miracle today, given the shifts that are happening in technology and policies and all that. So this brings me to my third point, which is to say that Nepal's policy space will be constricted much more by disruptive technologies and planetary behavior than the known processes of catch-up and the advantages of backwardness. So here, you know, the story is mostly revolved around energy 
the nature of uh, industry, manufacturing, already a lot has been uh, already explained in artificial intelligence, robotics, automation, the cloud technologies that we're seeing, and, and the typical process of catch up you know, that many of our East Asian peers followed was, you know, you, you really rely on off the shelf, cheap foreign technologies, you import them, and then you use that to uh, produce low end manufacturing, the entire world is your market, and then you make that leapfrog from low income to middle income status. I think uh, after the 1990s, and the story of China was very much uh, like this, Japan perhaps uh, decades earlier was also similar. This, but they catch up very fast and they, they graduate up the ladder. Right? And, and then they begin to shed many of these low end jobs and industries which move to other countries uh, on the lower rungs of development. And then, of course, uh, to go from uh, lower middle income to upper middle income and then, and then to make that leap up to higher, higher level, you need a different orientation of the economy, uh, in creative destruction, innovation, protection of pro property rights, uh, enforcement of contracts, you know, the independence of the judiciary, and all these things become much more important at higher levels of development. But to begin with, you know, even in a very corrupt and inefficient society, if you have sufficient uh, capital formation uh, going, you can make that leap from very low levels of development to low uh, levels. So there's three features, you know, growing old before becoming rich, urbanizing heavily uh, before meaningfully industrializing, and yet the characters of industrialization will have changed, and this issue about policy space, right? the traditional predictable processes of catch-up are no longer available, uh, some of this has been constructed by uh, the international norms and the organization that we are party to, uh, but it's mostly the policy innovations and the technological breakthroughs that are happening. So how do I link these three themes that we're witnessing in Nepal with the impact? The, uh, the Global Commission report on the future of work that uh, Sarah already presented. I like the basic uh, structure of the report. Uh, it talks about uh, the three forces that are changing the world. And it talks about three kinds of investments that we need to make uh, uh, in uh, each of our societies. So the three forces on demography, on uh, uh, an economic paradigm that is much more sustainable, and, uh, and the threats and the opportunities that disruptive technologies present are exactly mapped to the three idiosyncratic features that I mentioned about in the past. So in that regard, Quite unwittingly, unknowingly perhaps, you know, the global report has a direct resonance uh, to, to the development narrative that is unfolding in Nepal. Now, I'm pleased that ILO uh, 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 has also uh, you know, uh, produced this report because it's been about a decade when there's growing interest on these themes, particularly after the 2008 uh, global financial crisis. There's a heightened attention given to the issue of inequality, for example. The dominant narrative in the late 80s, 90s, early part of the century was, you know, let growth happen, let growth flourish, and uh, everything shall be taken care of. You know, this will trickle down, wages will rise, poverty will diminish, uh, and all that. That narrative or that uh, preposition about, uh, about uh, how development happens has been discredited. And, uh, you know, after uh, the global financing, financial crisis, this heightened attention to the issue of inequality, uh, the 2015 Paris Accords, the climate change. So all these issues are becoming much more important in the development story. So it's no longer a growth only story, but a growth plus uh, story um, that we need to invoke. Now the 2013 World Development Report, an institution, you know, uh, from an institution that is traditionally associated with uh, a kind of discredited paradigm that I talked about, uh, it was quite uh, progressive in its articulation of the need for a jobs-centered, jobs-oriented uh, development story. Uh, the, the, the framework that it um, uh, promoted was, of course, you know, jobs are associated with uh, rising living standards, jobs for the poor, women, you know, jobs um, uh, that do not shift the burden to others and all that. Jobs associated with productivity and linked to world markets, functional cities, there's a parallel literature here on how cities can be an endogenous source of economic growth in itself. And uh, unusually, it made a very passionate case for jobs as a glue to social cohesion. Right? So jobs giving a sense of fairness uh, and an opportunity to break uh, social barriers. In 2015, uh, UNDP followed suit and produced its own report uh, on, on work. 
uh, and, uh, and making a linkage to human development. We talked uh, in great length about the challenges posed by globalization, new technologies, and these innovative norms of social organization that are altered in the frontiers of employment. So by that, you know, talk about the sharing economy, for example. There's this famous anecdote and example that somebody, well, it's not my original formulation, but it said, you know, the largest com taxi company in the world now is Uber, without having owned a single taxi. Uh, the largest hotel company in the world is now Airbnb. It doesn't own a single hotel room. Uh, the largest media company in the world is Facebook, uh, yet it doesn't own any of the original content. Okay? This is the new sort of world. Uh, I think this is attributed to a guy called Tom Goodwin. I don't know who he is, but anyway, a clever way to formulate and indicate the shift that is happening in the world that we live in. Um, on the technological adoption and spread, I think one notable uh, fact to recognize is you know, economists and uh, you know, development practitioners often use this metric. You know, how after an invention, after an invention you know, that is patented and all that and is launched into the market, how long does it take for that particular invention to be adopted by, let's say, 50% of the household uh, in a major economy like the United States or, or the dominant European country? So in the case of automobile, uh, you know, 1908, uh, you know, Henry Ford's Model T and all that, it took 80 years for 50% of the population to adopt the technology. For airplanes, it was 70 years. And for telephones, the landline, the old uh, the technology, it was 60 years. But for cell phones, a new invention, it was less than 10 years. Right? So this gives you a hint of, uh, uh, of, the, of the, the pace of change uh, that is uh, that is. So these have implications for the kind of development strategies that countries like Nepal adopt. So there has to be a heightened emphasis on skills and education because it's much more important than ever to uh, take advantage of new, new opportunities that many of these shifts uh, uh, will, will, will pose. Uh, but along with this, you know, the flexibility is being matched by growing precariousness and you know, vulnerability. And this is where I think the issues of safe work, labor protections, uh, freedom of association, uh, are much more important, and the point here to emphasize is again, you know, low-income countries uh, today need to adopt these standards. And if you look uh, at the historical precedents, much earlier than the rich countries adopted them. Right? So this is a challenge. This poses a big fiscal uh, obligation uh, on us, and this is where I think inter international solidarity, international assistance, uh, will will be extremely. Let me say a little bit about the proposed uh, ILO uh, human centered agenda. So the report is basically about three shifts, three th sort of uh, forces that are changing the world, and the three kinds of investments that the ILO uh, suggests. The first is, of course, investing in uh, people's capabilities. The second is investing in the institutions of work. And the third is invest investment in decent and sustainable um, uh, sort of work environment. For me, I mean, I. As an economist, my, I would like to reinterpret that as basically advocating a new form of uh, new economic model where issues of vulnerability and sustainability loom much larger than now. Now, on the first one, uh, I'm glad that uh, you know uh, at least the UN agencies are beginning to talk to each other. Um, you know, in 1990, this issue of human development uh, was already there, but it, for, for a long, long time, there is UNDP in particular and UNICEF that really carried this event you know, on behalf of the UN. But over time, this has uh, been broadly embraced by the, by the rest of the world. And if you look at the, uh, the frequency and the intensity with which countries now produce national human development reports, you can argue that this is very much a universal phenomenon. I am very fortunate to have been associated with the human development sort of uh, development uh, uh, paradigm, if you want to put it that way, uh, for the last 25 years. My, my uh, uh, my uh, undergraduate uh, tutor was Mehmet Desai, Lord Desai, who was part of the initial sort of, uh, team of authors, along with Anand Kassan and Mahu Bal Haq. So from him and others that I subsequently uh, went to work with, uh, I was inculcated in this new, uh, new paradigm early on. I moved back to Nepal in 97 uh, and uh, was privileged to work on the first Nepali Human Development Report together with uh, Devendra Pandey and Chaitanya Misra. And then I've worked on series of other uh, human rights. So this language is very familiar to me, but uh, after decades, I think you know, the, that ILO has borrowed this uh, 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 in its entirety. 
and you know, owned it and adopted it and is now propagating it's really welcome. And um, so I'd like to actually congratulate uh, the organization for, uh, for, for doing this. Now, we used to define human development as a process of enlarging people's choices. Uh, and, um, and human development views uh, poverty as a deprivation of capabilities, not just incomes. And uh, you know, it's denial of choices and opportunities uh, to lead the kind of life that people have reason to choose and to value. It's a very precise, it's a very precise formulation coming from Amar Prasen himself, drawing on his previous work in the 80s and the early 90s with Martha Nosfum and others on how um, you know, development should be about formation of human capabilities. And, and by that, we're basically mean, you know, saying people should be educated, they should be skilled, they should be healthy, and in a position to command control over resources. So, so this is sort of flipping the whole uh, you know, income-centric uh, GDP uh, approach. The second part, as corollary, is equally important. It's not just formation of human capabilities, but uh, we need to be very conscious of the way in which people then go on to make use of those acquired capabilities for production, for leisure, for political economic liberties, and their participation in uh, social cultural affairs. So, you know, since the dynamism is not just expected in the economic sphere, but it's also in a vibrant uh, democratic uh, ambience uh, that we seek to nurture uh, today. So, I think the ILO components uh, that was explained earlier on lifelong learning, work transitions through the life cycle, you know, especially addressing the vulnerable points in a person's life cycle from early uh, childhood uh, to adolescence. Uh, uh, the various uh, uh, instances of vulnerabilities while working, and then the post-retirement uh, vulnerabilities associated with old age, pensions, social protection, and that, um, I think is very much forms very nicely um, uh, you know, in this human development paradigm. So I'm really pleased to see this uh, modern articulation uh, against the backdrop of the three big shifts that's happening. The second on investing in the institutions of work, I think uh, Dr. Nepal and Earlier speakers have already uh, touched on this. I think Nepal is uh, moving very fast on this. Um, we've been a laggard on the income front, but on the non-income indicators of income development, for example, nutrition, health, uh, literacy, um, you know, we, we do reasonably well in the global uh, exercises. Even in, uh, you know, our human development performance is much better than what our GDP per capita alone would suggest. Um, um, and on if you strip away the income component on the non-income HD indices, Nepal's progress is actually very dramatic and you can go back way up to the 1970s where you know, countries like China, Oman, and Nepal actually stood out and were, were uh, celebrated for that in the 2010 Human um, uh, Development Report as well. But um, as has already been said, you know, Labor Act, the new Social Security Act, the Prime Minister's Employment Program, a lot of it is being spearheaded by the Honorable Minister um, uh, in the current government. Uh, uh, is, is, is very much welcome. The challenge is, of course, in, uh, in faithful execution of this and to uh, stop uh, you know, the leakages and the, and the waste. Uh, you know, there are lots of issues associated with implementing large-scale programs such as these. And here, I think I, I, I would uh, call upon the government to be uh, very, um, uh, very open uh, to healthy critique uh, and, uh, and be um, and and, and be open-minded uh, in reforming as the program is rolled out. Right? So, uh, the, the most uh, detrimental part in, in launching these ambitious programs would be to, to be stubborn from, from the get-go. So I think um, it would be a very interesting point, and I think Dr. Nepal has elaborated on this. The third is you know, uh, on, on the kind of economic model. Right? So uh, here, we, we, I didn't quite like the terminology, terminology used and the phrasing. Uh, but you're really calling for a new kind of new sources of economic growth, new models, be, you know, the kind of forces that propel uh, these dramatic shifts in the 20th century no longer apply. And, uh, and, and this is where I think, uh, you know, for Nepal there are new opportunities. You know, there's this concept called advan advantage of backwardness. You can avoid the mistakes uh, that countries that went before you and uh, made and, uh, and leapfrog uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the frontier, to the state of the the new state of the technology. Um, so on demographic, demographic investment, I think a uh, big thing to note in Nepal is this uh, 
ballooning learning crisis in public schools. Uh, and uh, and uh, this issue of education, from early childhood education to this issue of lifelong learning, will be extremely important uh, to take advantage of the demographic dividend. Uh, in fact, you can equate demographic dividend being you know, directly conditional on the educational investments. That's very much uh, a stylized act now. And uh, but the other thing that is important is, you know, I started my speech by saying, you know, by, by quantifying the window that countries have um, uh, have uh, uh, available uh, for themselves to make this leap. Now you can actually lend them that demographic window. So Nepal can go from 26 years to uh, maybe 30, 35 years uh, before it becomes an easy society and that window for, for this big leap uh, is effectively shut. But for that, we need education. And so women need to marry late. Uh, children need to come later, so you can manipulate the demographic composition, but the way to do that is not coercive, but, uh, but, uh, but education. Right? So this is where well-informed, well-educated, well-skilled, uh, modern uh, you know, uh, girls and women coming into the sort of economy would help to alter uh, the demographic composition as well. So this is, in that regard, not a fake country, and with wise educational investments and interventions, we can actually play with uh, the kind of favorable window that, that, that we can. Um, on the institutional investment, I think uh, the, uh, in Nepal's case, the mandate is clear. You just read through the constitution and the heavy, you know, um, uh, the, the, the focus on the social rights, the fundamental rights, it's all clearly laid out. Uh, one good achievement of the current government uh, over the last year has been it, it was uh, able to. Uh, able to bring about 16 uh, uh, pieces of legislation uh, within the deadline stipulated by the Constitution that says that you know, these fundamental rights. Again, the issue is uh, you know, how faithfully we executed, do we have the funds, uh, and I think there the greater clarity will have to come from uh, the specific policies, the legislations, and the, and, and the regulations, how, how we craft them. Now finally, on the new source of growth, uh, as I said, you know, Nepal being a landlocked country, uh, it was even if the manufacturing exhibited the kind of characteristic that we associate with in the 20th century, it was never an easy adopt option for, for Nepal, given our uh, you know, transit costs, trade costs, uh, deficits, uh, uh, structurally embedded deficits and competitiveness. Right? So it was always uh, an imperative for Nepal to look out for uh, other sources of economic growth to propel us on this long path. I mean, you can have growth spurts for a year or two uh, when you know, a thing or two happens, you know, a big hydro coming into the pipeline, a major expressway being built, you know, some projects of capital formation, irrigation, airports being built and all that. But it will not be able to give you the kind of sustained economic growth uh, you know, that, um, that we say that we need if we really want to be richer before we become old. So here I think clean energy, uh, the challenge posed by climate, climate change, really uh, poses an opportunity for Nepal to fundamentally uh, reorient our development paradigm. So even within the, uh, you know, the traditional sources of economic growth, the opportunity posed by digitalization, I don't want to go into the details, but, uh, but for a landlocked country, this, is, you know, this has an added uh, emphasis. Uh, clean energy-driven manufacturing, agro-processing, and just a few days ago, I was very encouraged to hear from leading industrialists in this country on how garment, the garment industry can actually be revived in Nepal. Right? So in the uh, late 80s, the 90s, uh, we were basically taking advantage of the presence of global quotas. Uh, once the quotas were uh, removed under the agreement on textiles and clo clothing, that came after the MFA, the final arrangement in 2005, and countries, big countries, eff eff efficient producers from China and large uh, exporting nations were no longer uh, constrained by these global caps. You know, the industry died, but in our case, it was also propelled uh, in large measure by conflict. The big hope is that you know there are some vibrant textile companies that are already in existence. Now, as we speak, they're again surviving and thriving because there are temporary trade remedy measures being imposed on our bigger competitors from India, China, Indonesia in prospective markets like Turkey and the EU. But what encouraged me the other day in this dialogue was uh, the confidence that some of these leading uh, industrialists uh, showed that if we can build a more integrated chain, so you start from you know, garments. Uh, even cotton growing, for example, 
uh, to garments and then leading up to the more uh, sophisticated ends of this uh, chain, all the way from garments to textiles, I think Nepal actually has uh, some potential. So, you know, uh, so industries that once rose and collapsed still have uh, hope of uh, revival. Um, but let me end uh, with some thoughts on uh, a topic that is uh, of personal passion to me, clean energy, and, uh, um, and how through the electric vehicles, I think this can be one window through which we can view these larger transformations uh, uh, that are occurring in the world and how Nepal should be leapfrogging to these modern technologies. Um, um, I was fortunate to uh, be the first public official to procure uh, Nepal's uh, first electric vehicle using government's own resources when I was the vice chairman of the Planning Commission. I see that the president of Nepal and uh, the energy minister have also done that in recent years. But this needs to you know, um, become a phenomenon, not just an isolated anecdotal sort of instance. And, and there are reasons, uh, many reasons for that. I don't want to elaborate in detail, but you know, first thing is our heavy dependence on imported fossil fuel. So you know, just gradually replacing that will help reduce trade deficit. Um, this combustion of fossil fuels uh, involves putting carbon from deep underground and adding it to the atmosphere in the form of CO2. Um, now, while Nepal's contribution to global um, CO2 emissions is very small, by acting fast, I think the country can set a global example. The way Bhutan is doing with its carbon negative um, uh, campaign. Then switching to electric vehicles improves air quality. Vehicles running on fossil fuels emit air pollutant gases and particles into the atmosphere that are harmful to the human health and ecosystems. So even the best Euro um, uh, six emission standards only control uh, these partially. And fourth, electric vehicles carry large batteries that can be charged during off-peak hours, making better use of installed hydropower capacity thus uh, dropping the per unit cost of electricity. So the, the, you know, these are some of the nuances that are associated with, uh, with uh, promoting uh, this uh, new technology. And, uh, and, uh, and this is where Nepal, you know, rather than emulating the 20th century pattern of, sort of dirty manufacturing, can suddenly leapfrog and reorient our entire uh, uh, economic structure, which can then be a basis for the new kind of growth paradigm that I said would be necessary to propel growth on a longer term, you know, more than 10 years, sustained economic growth of 78% uh, percent with occasional double digit growth. Let me conclude with, uh, come back to the core theme of the report and, and, and highlight perhaps uh, areas where I could be working uh, in the future. So in the next steps, I think uh, the three forces, nudging three investments, uh, I think there's a good framework uh, relevant for Nepal as I've tried to uh, elaborate, uh, make that connection. So we need to localize now, localize now uh, you know, what do these three forces and the three investments mean uh, for each of our provinces and possibly many of our uh, municipalities, the local governments, uh, uh, hundreds of uh, uh, local governments. We need deep analytical work to inform uh, the policy process uh, credibly. And this is where I think uh, ILO and the, and the uh, Nepali think tanks uh, and uh, uh, Perhaps people like us can come in and, uh, uh, and help uh, with, uh, you know, through the tripartite uh, uh, forums that we have well established in this country and engage the government, the private sector, the trade unions uh, uh, to, to carry forth uh, this agenda in a coherent, uh, coordinated manner. Uh, and also, um, in a way that sort of reinforces uh, what the country has already announced it will do through the 15th periodic plan, for example, or even the longer term uh, vision papers uh, that uh, we've worked on in the past few years. So, um, so in other words, there's a lot of work to be done uh, uh, in, in really uh, spreading, widening, deepening uh, the core themes that this uh, report uh, has made. So, so, so you know, I end with a very positive note. And the one struggle that we used to have with the human development reports was you know, the recommendations used to be so broad but it is often very difficult to uh, you know, apply them to the national context. So the national launch events of the Human Development Reports, and even the World Development Reports, uh, used to be a very tricky affair. You know, it, uh, one really had to struggle to make those, you know, uh, those linkages. With this report, I think uh, the linkage and the salience is much more uh, linear, uh, organic, and, uh, and I think uh, legitimate. So, uh, 
With those words, let me conclude my statement. Thank you.